Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to The Correct Views. We raise a glass of wine to you the day of our good cheer. It is Christmas, and that means it is nothing but good news. That's what it means. It means good news all day, and that is exactly what we are going to have. Yesterday was like the humbuggery show, wasn't it? Today is not the humbuggery show. This is the nothing but good news Christmas show. Uh, for those of you that are trying to get in on the contest, uh, what is the contest? Uh, if anybody donates to Save Olivia, it's uh, on my site uh, between now and Christmas and proves it to me, I will go ahead and uh, ice bucket myself on Christmas Day. Go look at the video. It's time for the Christmas show. The introductions are over. It is time to begin it. Guys, yesterday, I admit I was not in the world's greatest mood. That is a Halford, by the way, Christmas for everyone. As long as we're commenting on it, they can't tell me I can't use it. Rob Halford did a Christmas album. How cool is that? Friends, we'll listen to it during the break. You're here for the news, and the news you are going to get. Eric Garner's wife. I don't feel like it's a black and white thing. Why did this make the good news show? Because there has been virtually no good news whatsoever to come out of any of the Garner incident. Many of you know I was not exactly weeping over Brown. I thought in many ways, while I'm sorry that he died, Brown had it coming to him. I have not felt that way about Garner. Well, his wife brings a little bit of common sense into the discussion here. The wife of Eric Garner, and for those of you that don't know, he is the New York man choked to death on video by a police officer, has spoken out to dismiss claims that the incident was racially motivated. Appearing on NBC's Meet the Press, Esau Snipes said, quote, I don't even feel like it's a black and white thing, honestly. You know, it's my opinion. Garner's wife said that she believes that her husband was murdered unjustly, but that his skin color had nothing to do with it. And that is true, friends. This is all about unity. This is a holiday where we're all supposed to be peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Towards men. If you're in a badge, you don't need to kill a man for selling cigarettes. And I'm happy that his wife is standing up and realizing the police are doing this to everyone. Not all police. If you are a police officer watching this show, Merry Christmas. Snipes said that during routine encounters with police, police officers would fixate on the fact that Garner had a history of selling loose cigarettes, saying cops harassed the couple when they went out shopping. So basically, when he wasn't even doing anything wrong, he'd just be walking through a store. They had to make little stabs and jabs at him and try to humiliate him day and night. They say things like, hi, cigarette man, hey, cigarette man, wife, you know, stuff like that, she said. I feel like it's something that he continued to do, and the police knew. You know, they knew, Snipes added, after explaining that Garner often turned to selling cigarettes because he failed to hold down a job due to his poor health and laziness. You know what? That is wonderful honesty. I am dead serious. May God dip her twice in the blessing machine. But, again, does selling loose cigarettes if the government doesn't get the tax, which they have no right to do anyway, especially at the level that they do, does it warrant a death? I would say not. Snipes also stated that, that as far as she knew, Garner never resisted arrest, and he did not. You can see in the video. I am not saying he was a career criminal, but I am saying that he had a past of being arrested, Snipes said. And he never, not once, ever resisted arrest. So he didn't have a history of it. This wasn't something that they went ahead and did um, because he had a history of resisting when they arrested him. The comments echo those of Garner's very wise daughter, who revealed to CNN last week that she did not consider race to be a factor leading to her father's murder. This is not a black and white issue, Erica Garner told Don Lemon, adding, this is a national crisis while appealing for unity. May God bless Erica. I mean, for white people to come out and show how deeply they was hurt, and like Asians, you know, different people from different nations in different parts of the world, to come out and show that they felt the same way I felt on the video, I greatly appreciate it. It's like a sense of, not the, I'm not the only one that feels this way, the girl, the young girl urged. What, do you mean white people like me that were out here saying that these cops killed Mr. Garner? Yeah, we support you, white or not. And I'm glad they see that. 
Similar comments were made by the cousin of Michael Brown, the 18-year-old shot by Officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson. I had not known this. Ty Pruitt contract, contacted InfoWars to express his agreement that the protest against the death of Eric Brown, uh, excuse me, the death of Brown and Eric Garner, should not be focused on race, but on preventing police brutality. So there you go, friends. Um, and again, it, it's up on the site if you want to see it. It's listed on Prison Planet. It says, hey, brother, this is Ty Pewitt, Mike Brown's older cousin. I have been saying the same thing in my interviews. I'm working on waking black people up to the fact that subject, to the fact of that subject. Great rant. It's not about race, but keeping us apart gives them all of the power. Knowing who you, knowing who your real enemy is empowers you, and I don't mean the police, I mean the power structure that leads to this abuse, and the power structure that is uh, continued to be supported when you vote Republican or Democrat. Friends, LewRockwell.com continuing on our racial unity rant. This is Should Ra Profiling Be Banned? This is by Walter E. Williams. Walter E. Williams is a man that I would love to run for president. You thought that I was happy when Ron Paul was running? You thought I was happy when Gary Johnson started polling well? Ha! <laughs> Let Walter E. Williams run for president. And I will be so obsessed with getting him into office that I may contemplate quitting my job to make it happen. And guess what, friends? He's a black man. Last week, the Obama administration, he writes, announced new curbs on racial profiling by federal law enforcement. Before deciding whether this is good or bad policy, we might want to try to develop a description slash definition of racial profiling or any other kind of profiling. A good definition of profiling in general is the use of an easily observed physical characteristic as a guess for some other difficult to observe characteristic. The reason that people profile is that information is costly and they seek methods to economize on information costs. One way to do this is through profiling. Imagine a chief of police in a city where there has been a rash of automobile hubcap thefts and he's trying to capture the culprits. Should he have his officers stake out and investigate residences in senior citizens' homes, he asks. What about spending resources investigating men and women 40 or older? I would imagine that he would have greater success in capturing the culprits by focusing most of his resources on younger people, and particularly on young men. Doing so would more likely lead to the capture of the culprits because hubcap theft is a young man's game. My question to you is whether you'd bring charges against the police, Chief, because he used age and sex profiling and didn't investigate seniors and middle-aged adults. Um, again, it's a, and not everything is perfect. In my neighborhood, there are middle-aged adults doing such things, but you get the point. Some years ago, a Washington, D.C. taxicab commissioner, who is black, issued a safety advisory urging D.C. 6,800 predominantly black cabbies to refuse to pick up dangerous-looking passengers. Cabbies in D.C. and other cities often bypass black males for fear of robbery or of being taken into an unsafe neighborhood as my tree falls over. We seriously misunderstand the motives of a taxi driver who racially profiles and passes up a black customer if we use racism as the sole explanation for this behavior. And you want to know something? I was a cab driver for a decade. And people oftentimes will think, well... You didn't pick this person up because he was black. A lot of times it would be the neighborhood, not the race. I don't want to be robbed by a white or a black guy. Um, I would lock my doors when someone was standing on the corner. Therefore, that must mean that I'm somehow racist, except for the fact that I also do it when white people were standing on the corner. I've told this story before. The reality is that race and other behavior characteristics are correlated, including criminal behavior. That fact does not dispel the insult, embarrassment, anger, and hurt of a law-abiding black person might feel when being stopped by police, being watched in stores, being passed up by taxi drivers, standing at traffic lights and hearing car door locks activated, that's nothing to do with color, I just explained it, or being refused delivery by merchants who fear for their safety in his neighborhood. Now that is the case. Again, I said I'd vote for him, I never said he was perfect. It is easy to direct one's anger at the taxi driver for, or for the merchant. 
However, the behavior of taxi drivers and owners of pizza restaurants cannot be explained by a dislike of dollars from black hands. A better explanation is they might fear for their lives. The true villains to whom anger should be directed are the tiny percentage of people in the black community who prey on both blacks and whites, and who have made blacks synonymous with crime. There is little noticed racial profiling in medicine. Some racial and ethnic groups have a higher incidence of mortality than various diseases than the national average. Mortality rates for cardiovascular diseases are approximately 30% higher among black adults than among white adults. Cervical cancer rates are almost five times higher, he writes, among Vietnamese women in the U.S. than among white women. The Pima Indians of Arizona have the highest known diabetes rate in the world. I didn't know that. Prostate cancer is nearly twice as common among black men as it is among white men. Would one condemn a medical practitioner for advising greater screening and monitoring of black men for cardiovascular disease and prostate cancer or greater screening and monitoring for cervical cancer among Vietnamese American women or the same for diabetes among Pima, Pima Indians? In other words, if you warn somebody based on the medical knowledge of it, are you racist or are you profiling based on knowledge? That's what he's asking. It surely would be racial profiling, using race as an indicator for a higher probability of some other characteristic that might kill you and save your life. God would never do profiling of any sort because God is omniscient. Merry Christmas. We, that means all-seeing, all-knowing for you Kesha fans. We humans lack that quality and must depend upon sometimes crude substitutes for finding out things. By the way, my attempting to explain profiling doesn't require one to take the position for or against it any more than the attempt to explain gravity requires one to be for or against gravity. Guys, that's our racial unity story once again brought to you by Walter E. Williams, the black man that I would proudly, happily, and obsessively vote for and support for president. Moving on on our good news show. I have desecrated this poor tree, haven't I? Moving on on our good news show. Steve Watson, PrisonPlanet.com. Rand Paul plans Bill to end police militarization. How many of you know what posse comitatus is? Anybody at all? Are you looking at me like I have no idea? A posse comitatus is the uh, the law that says that we cannot we, we don't have a standing army in this country that we do not have an army of people that come out against people in the country Rand Paul has been against this in every possible way because what the military is doing is arming the police as if they were the military now you might argue Sam what happens if the Ferguson riots were to become so bad what if they had become so bad that we needed these military vehicles there. What do you think we have a National Guard for? I mean, really, use the thinking part of your brain. You do not give the police willy-nilly use over these things. Because if you do, you have SWAT teams, which everybody thought was a great idea. Oh, we're going after pedophiles. No, you're throwing concussion flash grenades at infants when you go into the wrong house. Look it up. It happened. SWAT teams are going after people for tax evasion. I've reported on it here prior. Senator Rand Paul, it says, plans to introduce legislation to end the disturbing trend of military equipment ending up in the hands of domestic law enforcement departments across the country. Merry Christmas and God bless you, Rand. You're not nearly as amazing as your father was, but you're better than Hitlery. And it, let me pause. A lot of people will say, well, you're just voting for the lesser, the lesser of two evils. I wrote an entire song about never doing that. Hillary Clinton is evil. Rand Paul, while not likely to make a great president, will certainly make a very good president. And settling for Rand Paul, and I'm not saying that you should, but if I do, and I don't know if I will, Settling for Rand Paul is not the lesser of two evils, because while he is not as great and as awe-inspiring and as libertarian as his father was, Rand Paul is not evil. So don't give me the lesser of two evil. I get, I, I, I'm, he's, a, he, he's, uh, he's said a number of things that I've covered on this show repeatedly that I don't agree with, but uh, he's not evil, so don't say that. 
Paul's staff revealed to BuzzFeed that the Kentucky senator will re-energize the debate on the matter in 2015. He will focus on ending transfers of military weapons and vehicles under the Defense Department's 1033 program, which has seen billions of dollars worth of excess military gear transferred to police and sheriff's departments in the last two decades. And again, what has that done? It has increased SWAT activity when they're not even needed. Paul's legislation will be similar, similar to that introduced earlier this year by retiring Oklahoma Senator Tom Coburn and Democratic Representative Hank Johnson of Georgia. Rand Paul has previously slammed the militarization of police as stupid and ridiculous, saying that using the threat of terrorism as a justification is a tired excuse. Amen. FEMA gave out 12,000 bayonets last year. That's just stupid, the senator urged recently. We are giving out mine-resistant ambush protection vehicles, 20-ton vehicles. Dundee, Michigan, a town of 3,000 people, has a 20-ton mine-resistant ambush protection vehicle. That's ridiculous. But Sam, if they don't, they won't be able to get them. National Guard. We have no-knock raids, and a little boy had a concussion grenade thrown in her face and a little baby had a concussion grenade thrown in her face at one of the morning without a with a at one in the morning without a knock near Atlanta about two months ago, he said. I was just talking about that one. Sometimes it's a mistake of police being too aggressive, but sometimes it's putting police in an untenable position to enforce laws that really we should not be enforcing to that degree of force. Again, it's not necessarily being against the police. Merry Christmas. It's supposed to be for terrorism, but try to explain to me when terrorists are going to attack Dundee, Michigan, or Fargo, North Dakota, Paul added. As we have previously reported, several local law enforcement agencies have previously stated that they wish to return the military gear, which they feel was somewhat forced onto them by the Department of Defense. Uh, the counties in which the sheriff offices and departments are based are being asked to absorb the cost of transporting huge armored vehicles. So once again, Rand Paul, thankfully, on the right side of history here. And we got three stories left, nothing but good news, but we're going to go back to, uh, to this real quick. I love Rob Halford. All right, friends, I want to ask you if you get a chance. Singer of Judas Priest. If you get a chance, go to the Arcadia Grill. Why? Because the Arcadia Grill has some of the absolute best food that you have ever eaten. And I want you to go there and I want you to enjoy it. And I want you to let them know that you heard about it from Sam at The Correct Views. We're having fun on Christmas. No, I'm not being nine kinds of professional. You know why? Because it's Christmas and it's the good news show. And we don't always do good news shows. Normally we have this going wrong and that going wrong and people dying and libertarians losing and Republicans winning and Hillary Clinton going to be the next president. How? Let's have some fun. How about it? This is great news. Six herbs to help boost brain power. Don't tune out. Why? Because I'm not selling you any of these. You can buy them anywhere and they're cheap. We're going to go through them real quick. We'll be over it in three minutes. Or if you're bored by this, just hang in there. we got the dumb D of the day coming and it's really dumb. One and two, periwinkle and ginseng. I take ginseng. Both of these herbs improve cognitive function. They have both been studied by researchers at the Uni of Northumbria in Tyne, England and can be used together to boost cognitive abilities. Ginseng is great as an alternative to synthetic medications for ADHD and ADD. I don't know how much it helps for that since I have it and it, I don't know, but I guess it could be worse. It is also known to possess compounds to protect like, from radiation. And those of you that don't know, uh, this show is very heavy anti-nuclear. Look up the correct views, Fukushima. Get ready for like nine years of videos. Three! Vincristine, extracted from periwinkle as a natural constituent, viscretine is, I haven't even heard of it, is one of the most powerful anti-cancer drugs in the world. Isn't that wonderful? In fact, it has significantly, significantly increased the survival rate for acute childhood leukemia. That is blood cancer. However, periwinkle's vincristine, vince, why can't I say this today? Vincristine, 
also offers huge positive neurocognitive effects and reduces brain tumors. And many of you know, if you get a brain tumor, particularly a cancerous one, you're as good as dead. I've only known two people to ever beat it. And there you go. Good news show. Four, Guta Cola. G-U-G-O-T-U Cola K-O-L-A. While this herb is said to boost brain power in general, Guta Cola is also considered to be an aptogen, which means it lowers stress. Now, that might be needed. Stress has an incredibly abhorrent effect on our brain's ability to process information and to see things clearly, acting rapidly via catch catecholamines and uh, more slowly via glucocorticoids. Do I know what those are? No, but many of you say that I don't give any sources. So there you go. Many of you do know what it is and you're like, hey, that's great. What's the bottom line? It's a stress reducer. It helps a lot. And it says it's also, um, its actions involve beta adrogenic receptors and also availability of glucose. Whereas a glucoco glucocorticoids biophysically moderate sympathetic plasticity over hours and reduce long-term changes basically prevents the dumbing down of your brain five a smelling a rosemary how easy is that a team of scientists from the uni of north umbria uk has discovered that one of the active essential oils which gives rosemary its favorable scent improves speed and accuracy when performing certain mental tasks. Thanks to 8 sinole, the main chemical constituent in the plant, we can score higher on tests and just function better mentally on a daily basis from smelling the herb. That would be rosemary. And last, ginkgo biloba. This herb actually helps to regenerate brain cells. Uh, again, very, very good since so many people around us drive us so insane that we burn them up with stress. While the research isn't conclusive, numerous studies have found this herb to be beneficial for improving memory and adding intellectual zeal. If you're taking blood thinning medications, it says you should check with your doctor before ingesting the herb because it can cause brain bleeding if used with certain blood thinners. Otherwise, it's been used for a 250 million year period, so I would say it has been tested. All right, guys, two more stories on the good news. You want the dumdy of the day. It's going to be right after this. But I could not do a good news show without this. Somebody, this Christmas, somebody watching me, leave, leave a comment down there if you are one of those people. Somebody watching this show has a loved one that is, uh, it has a fake arm, fake leg, uh, fake hand, whatever. Well, listen to this. This is from DailyDot.com. New smart skin will give artificial limbs the sense of touch. This is by Alex LaFerla. Researchers in South Korea have developed a smart skin that could give people with prosthetic limbs a sense of touch. There's a link for it. In its current form, it doesn't look like much more than a thick layer of plastic draped over a robotic hand, but its implications for the future of prosthetics could be much more significant than its appearance would suggest. It says that the artificial skin can process pressure, temperature, and humidity. Temperature is a very important one. Making it suitable for a range of real-world situations, including handshaking, typing, gripping, and sensing dry and wet surfaces. surfaces. Now, imagine for a minute you're watching this, and you're zoning out, and you're kicking back, and you're in Colorado smoking a joint, whatever. Think about it. Imagine if something happened to your hand. Something happened to your hand, and you can't type anymore. How much do you use the internet? How the hell did you find me if you didn't use the internet? Imagine how hard it would be to type sitting there pecking with one finger. Unless you're Stephen King, you're no good at it. He never learned to type. The smart skin even has features built in to make it feel more human-like, including a heating system to make it as warm as living tissue and a similar elasticity and texture to human skin. So shaking hands with someone like this wouldn't be creepy to uh to use the word rather inappropriate word but you know what i mean no hate on the christmas show for prosthetic devices and artificial skin to feel natural their temperature profile must be controlled to match that of the human body the authors write in their paper another link published today in nature communications now friends that's that's amazing news it says the new skin is primarily made 
here we go again, of polydimethylsilicane, siloxane, or PDMS. They could have said that first. And flexible, transparent silicone material. Tucked within the PDMS are silicone nanoribbons that respond with an electrical impulse when touched to provide a source of feedback to the user. Where greater flexibility is required, such as around the wrist, the nanoribbons are grouped in a somewhat loose arrangement to allow movement. So you might even be able to play keyboards again for you fellow musicians. At the fingertips, where flexibility is less of an issue and maximum sensitivity is desired, maybe not keyboards, the nano ribbons are grouped together as tightly as possible. So that's how they do it. It says the humidity sensors in the skin were tested on diapers and were able to determine which were wet and which were dry. So they work very well because urine is both wet and temperature sensitive. Eventual wearers of the skin will surely be glad to know that they can perform this test. They might want to leave the actual diaper humidity test to a sense other than touch. That's great. In another odd but telling experiment, the creators tested the skin's ability to hold a consistent 98 degrees Fahrenheit by placing the hand on a plastic baby doll and measuring how much heat was transferred to the doll. Kim Dae Hyong, one of the authors of the study, says that the technology has been patented, but that much of the work remains to be done before the artificial skin hits the market. Nevertheless, the smart skin could be a major step in the continued development of prosthetic limbs, allowing their users to once again more fully interact with their surroundings. Friends, that brings us to the dum de dum de dum de dum de of the day. Um, it was going to be Sony for pulling the interview, but now they are going to go ahead and show it. They didn't capitulate to Kim Jong-il. Uh, what do you need to know about North Korea? North Korea is attacking Sony. Meanwhile, South Korea is inventing fake skin that works. That's all you need to know about North Korea. So the dumdy of the day today is from Zero Hedge, and anytime ISIS has a bad day, anytime ISIS looks stupid, then we are happy. Merry Christmas. ISIS unleash scorpion bombs in Iraq. Yes, scorpion bites can be fatal. Normally they are not. Just when you thought you had seen it all, Islamic State militants turn up the amplifier of terror to 11. As the Mirror reports, ISIS is launching bombs containing live scorpions as the latest terror weapon in Iraq. Sure to be uh, deadly to anybody that doesn't own a boot or a hammer or a rock. Canisters of the creatures, I can't even believe I'm reporting, but it's true, are being blasted into towns and villages, according to a British military expert who has just returned from the country. Hamish de Breton Gordon, ex-head of chemical and biological weapons for the Army and NATO, I can do some foreign languages, said, It's madness. I have in I, I have imp not English. I have improvised devices to launch them. The weapon harks back to the scorpion stuffed into pots and launched by Iraqis thousands of years ago in 198 AD. <laughs> they have reportedly, I've reported on it, look up ISIS dirty bomb correct views. I've reported on how they have the ability to, to make a dirty bomb, which is putting uh, uranium that was being tested at a college on a bomb and blowing it up. Thankfully, that seems to not have worked yet, and they have resorted to scorpions. Am I the only one who is incredibly not scared here? As the Mirror reports, Islamic State militants are launching bombs containing live scorpions as the latest terror in Iraq. It doesn't say, meanwhile, people in Iraq lack their asses off. Laugh so hard that their turbans fall off. Moron. Canisters of the creatures are being blasted into towns and villages, according to a British military expert who has just returned from the country. Hamish de Breton Gordon, ex-head of chemical and biological weapons for the Army and NATO, said, It's madness! I have improvised devices to launch them. They promote the fact that they are doing it, and it creates panic. I'm not panicking. I'm sorry. Crickets, nothing. 
He said the two foot bombs are not causing mass casualties, but a massive psychological impact. Among who? Two-year-olds? Mr. D. Branson Gordon of Avon Protection Systems returned from Baghdad last week where he was advising security forces who don't know how to step on scorpions. Senior Iraqi officials reported the beasts, oh, they're beasts, were being used to target civilian areas in north of the country. The weapon harks back to scorpions stuffed into pots and launched by Iraqis thousands of years ago in 198 AD. They were defending themselves against the Roman invasion. Maybe if Rome comes knocking at your door, it might just be wise to have something else planned other than the scorpion bomb. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Merry Christmas. And I mean that. I mean that to all of you. Low deaf people right here. High deaf people right there. Merry Christmas. God bless you. Thanks for tuning into this show. Please donate to the show if you can. All money given to me goes towards a better show. And you can donate to me at the correct views at hotmail.com. Also, go to the mediaspeaks.com and look up the work of Kyle, Court, D. Lake, and myself. Merry Christmas. God bless you. And Rob Halford does the best Christmas carols ever. <laughs>